it's a pleasure to to be here. Uh, many, many uh, really interested uh, young scientists eager to learn more about different techniques in biophysics. Uh, simulations is just one of them. But let me try to convince you that it can generate lots of added value to uh, experimental sciences. Uh, in our team, we have uh, one of these must be things. And, and, and one of them is that every PhD student has to pass a course in techniques in biophysics. It's basically a book about 600 to 800 pages where we don't discuss any uh, simulation techniques. Instead, we just go through different experimental ones. What I'm saying here is that for a simulation person, it's absolutely crucial to understand how experiments are done, how to interpret experiments, what really is measured in experiments. Because if you are doing simulations without this understanding, then it's very difficult or, or impossible to couple your simulation predictions to experiments. Say, in science, you had to prove your predictions. And, and it's, it's very easy to make simulation models. Uh, it's much more difficult to make simulation models which are valid, consistent with biology. And, and to that end, uh, we absolutely need to collaborate experimental people such that these predictions we are doing by simulations are able to match a reality. Uh, we started this work about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, uh, my, my personal history in computer simulations or computers is, is a bit longer. I think I was 10 plus when I got my first computer, that was week 20. Um, uh, you, you might think that I'm one of these ancient persons <laughs> in this context, that's true. Since week 20, it was the first ever computer that was sold to the uh, big markets, and not just for hardcore scientists in the labs, but really to the big markets. And, and I was brainwashed about its excellence. When I was working on Commodore 64, which is known as one of the classics, uh, I learned different lang uh, computing languages. Uh, how to go down into the uh, hardware, so to do machine language assembler and so forth. And I have been in this business ever since. Uh, so this figure at the top, uh, at the bottom left, uh, is the uh, first supercomputer we had in Finland. That's Cray XMP. It looks funny, but during those times, it was really massively powerful. These days, your mobile phones, I think, are able to generate computing capacity that is beyond Cray XMP. But during those years, uh, one was able to do quite a bit of things already during those years to complement experiments. So what we had done in our team in, in Helsinki or in Finland in general is to try to understand biology, living systems. So uh, the motto here is that we do computer simulations and theory to uh, improve health. Uh, this also implies that most of the collaborations we have are directed into biomedical teams who are doing cell biology, pharmacology, structural biology, and so forth. And we have lots of these collaborations. Uh, the uh, context where we are working is to understand signaling. And, and that is highlighted by this figure on the left. We have memory receptors, receptors which are embedded in cell membranes. And these are like local post offices in our daily life. Uh, you have letters coming from somewhere. They are delivered to the local post office, which tries to put them into order. After doing that, they are sent to the homes somewhere nearby. And now if something goes wrong in this process, but these letters are delivered to a, to a wrong address, then obviously something bad happens. Uh, however, if the letters are, are not delivered at all, at all for whatever reason, that's even worse news. Or if the same letter is published 100 times and delivered to 100 addresses and, and 99 of them are wrong, then that is also bad news. In every one of these cases, what usually happens is that you get some sort of disease. That's not fun. So the key to understand signaling is really to understand memory receptors, which are the hubs. They are the uh, sort of centers of, of communication. And the difficulty arises from 
a point that not many membrane receptor structures are known. There are hundreds of thousands of structures in a PDB databases collecting protein structures for proteins which are water soluble. This is quite easy to do. I'm not saying that it's easy, but it's easier to do compared to membrane receptors. Uh, and, and meanwhile, for membrane receptors, the number of structures is quite modest, uh, just a few hundred, basically. Uh, and that, of course, makes studies of membrane receptors quite difficult, both experimentally, because interpretation data is difficult if you don't know the structure, and also in terms of the simulations, because we can't do simulations unless we know the structure to start with. We can do dynamics, but to start with dynamic uh, uh, studies uh, through simulations, we need the static image of what the protein exactly look like, looks like, that the chemistry is exactly the right one. Um, the uh, topics we explore uh, by these membrane receptor investigations is to understand how their function can be modulated. It could be lipids in the membrane. It's, it's common knowledge that if you, if you have a bad diet, then the uh, lipid composition in the membranes is somehow altered. Uh, if you don't eat properly, then the lipid composition in your brain will be altered. And I would guess, as an educated guess, that it doesn't have very nice consequences. So please eat properly, please. Uh, then we have sugars glycans, which are attached to the proteins, and, and they have some really, really extraordinary functions which we don't understand. That is one of the least understood topics at the moment in membrane biophysics. And then you have other modifications, including mutations. Uh, quite often the disease arises because of the mutations, because it's changing the activation mechanism. So the uh, proteins are activating themselves without any particular reason, so simply because of the mutations. So all these ideas are what we are doing in our team together, experimental teams. Uh, of course, the cornerstone, the key cornerstone of membrane biophysics is experimental science, because when you are really measuring reality, what takes place in a living system, but there are limits. And, and the most crucial limit, uh, in my opinion, is about the resolution. Uh, if you go into the uh, state-of-the-art techniques, a super-resolution microscopy, which allows you to see what happens in a cell, the resolution is usually about 30 to 50 nanometers. Some people state that it's just a few nanometers, maybe five, but these are cases which are published under quite extreme conditions, for example, for a crystal or under semi-crystalline conditions, and, and that's not really a typical situation where uh, super resolution microscopies are used. I think this is a quite fair statement, even for state and, and other techniques, that 30 nanometers is close to the minimal resolution you can probe. Now, what do you see in 30 nanometers? Lipids are usually of a size of maybe two nanometers. Proteins, their size is quite diffuse but it's of the order of five to 10 nanometers, typically each. And that, that implies that if you have a protein complex comprised of two or more proteins bound together, um, using super resolution microscopies, you can't identify what proteins are bound to one another. You, you are not able to see the structure. You just can't because the resolution is not good enough. Uh, for that purpose, you have other techniques, say X-ray crystallography, NMR, cryo-EM, but then again, you have static images. And quite often in these techniques, you have conditions which can be used to debate the quality of your data. For example, crystallization, everybody knows that the uh, structures you get after crystallization might be quite different from the native ones. Cryo-M is better, but in cryo-M, the technology is just improving. It's very difficult to get high resolution structures. We are able to identify the positions of every atom in detail. So these techniques are emerging, but the point is that we have a gap in terms of resolution and also time resolution that experiments are not able to cover. And that's the reason why we are doing atomistic simulations.
atomistic and coarse grain simulations. Atomistic ones are those where we identify these molecules such that we uh, consider them uh, atom by atom for proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, water, in every one of them, every atom is included. The state of the art here is roughly a few million atoms in a simulation system, which means that the box size in 3D for the simulation box is about 10 to 20 nanometers, which is already quite good. And it can be increased if you, are, if you have access to really major supercomputers. The simulation times are now up to, say, a millisecond, and maybe a bit more. And that, of course, depends on the system size you are exploring, because these go hand in hand regarding the computer's capacity to, to carry out the simulations. Then there are so-called coarse grain molecular simulation models, where one, instead of describing the molecules in atomistic detail, you now cluster atoms together. You create so-called beads uh, represented by these spheres. Every one of these spheres tries to, uh, uh, in an effective way, describe what happens inside the sphere within a cluster of five to 10 atoms. Um, if you are clever enough, you can uh, identify uh, molecular shapes which are representing the right topology. You still maintain the right physics, for example, electrostatic interactions, phase behavior, and so forth. But of course, you are losing most of the chemistry, for example, hydrogen bonding capacity, because you are no longer describing uh, these molecules atom by atom. But the point is that by reducing computational complexity, you are able to increase system sizes and time scales quite dramatically. Um, I said that in atomistic simulations, one can do simulations up to a millisecond. In coarse grain simulations, you can do simulations up to seconds at least, depending on, on the uh, amount of coarse graining you carry out. This is the only slide where I'm using any, any equations. Uh, this is high school physics. We have Newton's equation motion, mass, acceleration, force for every atom, I, one by one. Then we have a force arising from a gradient of the uh, potential at a given time. This potential arises from different times uh, under Wallace interactions, which are basically uh, dispersion interactions, then electrostatics for two charged particles one at a time, then uh, bonded interactions for two particles bonded together, three particles bonded together, four particles bonded together, for example, in sterile backbones, in sterile molecules, and so forth. And, and this is a sort of minimal standard what people are using, that, that if you have these terms, then you are able to reach quantitative agreement between simulations and experiments. Quantitative agreement. And quite, that's quite amazing, since if you look at these equations describing these interactions, we have quite a few parameters. Sigma, describing the hardcore size of a given atom. Epsilon, describing the depth of a potential well between two particles under these Van der Waals interactions. Then we had two parameters, uh, the typical distance, a sort of equilibrium distance between two particles when they're bonded together, for example, in hydrocarbon chain, and then their force constant. Another two particle uh, uh, parameters, just a few more. And then we have these parameters, three, five, seven, eight, nine. So roughly 10 parameters for every atom type. Then how many atom types do you have? Well, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, hydrogen, at least. And then you essentially have a system where you have 40 to 100 free parameters. 40 to 100 free parameters in simulation model. How many parameters do you need in order to feed an elephant? I had done that. If you are using adaptive fitting, then, then it's about 30. 
if you have 30 parameters, you can make an excellent elephant. If you want to get the shape without all these fine details, 10 parameters is enough. 10 parameters to fit an elephant. And here in the simulation model, we have 40 to 100 free parameters. So does this make any sense? Well, pretty much it does, because most of these parameters can be extracted from experiments. For example, equilibrium distance between two particles, that is based on crystallization, electromicroscopy, spectroscopy, and other parameters as well. These force constants can be found from spectroscopic measurements too. Then it's basically just one parameter which is difficult to estimate, and that is with sigma van der Waals radius, describing the size of an individual atom, because this depends on the context, what other atom types, what other molecules are nearby this atom you are considering. So the sigma parameter is difficult, and that is typically determined from quantum mechanical simulations, quantum chemistry. But all, all in all, uh, it's not a, a, an impossible exercise to develop simulation models which are really valid by the simulation predictions are consistent experimental findings. Here's one example. One of the really big questions in the field is, is to understand protein folding. And, and whoever is able to design a theory uh, that based on a sequence of, of residues, amino acids in a row, you can predict the final three dimensional structure for this uh, uh, amino acid sequence. Whoever does that will certainly be granted the Nobel Prize. I believe so. I'm, I'm not in the committee, but, but I will, I'm, I'm pretty confident that if you are able to resolve the protein folding problem, then you are one of the people on the shortlist for the Nobel Prize. Uh, we currently don't have this theoretical understanding, but we have techniques able to predict protein folds. This is a paper published already 10 years ago by one of the really big simulation teams in, in biophysics. Uh, in blue, there is the simulated structure for one of the sequences starting from a completely random fold. And this blue, one, sorry, a red one uh, is the one that has been found from experiments. So just look at this comparison, red versus blue. Blue being the simulation prediction, red being the experimental observation. And now here for 12 different proteins, there's an excellent match. The results were not put in. They just used one of these interaction descriptions known as a force field to start a simulation for these uh, amino acid sequences from a random fold. And they ended up in a confirmation that matches experimental reality. So these models we are using simulations, they do make sense. Of course, we need also quite a bit of computing power. Uh, the first computers were designed in 1970s after the Second World War. Uh, ENIAC was the first one. MANIAC 1 was the second. The third one was called MANIAC 2. Don't ask me where these num uh, names are coming from, but they are really, really nice. Um, these computers were based on electron tubes. And, and obviously, the computing capacity was not very, very large. Um, these computers were able to do roughly 10 to 4 operations per second. These days, your mobile phones are much, 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 much more efficient compared to these computers. But nonetheless, this was the state of the art in 1950s. These days, we have better computers. Uh, the supercomputers we are using are about 10 to 14 times more effective compared to ENIAC, able to do 10 to 14 operations per second. And, and this is what you will see then. This is just one of the examples that we are doing in our simulations in, in Helsinki. We have a lipid membrane comprised of many different lipids. You have uh, uh, cholesterol, sphingomyelin, uh, phosphatidylcholines, other lipids, the different varying amounts of unsaturation. And then we have a protein, protein embedded in a membrane. We are looking at the influence of the lipids. So if you change the lipid composition, what happens for the protein? If you are adding ligands, uh, through glycosylation to the protein, then again, what happens? 
uh, how all of these different factors are affecting the probability of a protein to bind to its uh, uh, drugs and other ligands and so forth. And these simulations can cover times up to a millisecond. So why this millisecond time scale is important? Since for quite many proteins or for most of the receptors in membranes, the activation takes place about a millisecond. The whole process of the activation, starting from ligand binding, going through the conformational changes of the protein, then on the cytosolic side, doing the chemistry such that some processes, for example, a uh, phosphorylation takes place. So you receive a signal, you uh, uh, transfer the signal through the membrane, and then you submit the signal from the cytosolic side to the next destination. This whole process is about a millisecond. And now we have computing capacities and simulation models able to simulate these systems and at any other mystic detail over the millisecond time scale. We are right now going through this paradigm change where simulations are able to study the full process of a signaling event, starting from activation to the delivery of a signal uh, to the, uh, to the uh, final destination inside a cell. Here's another example based on coarse grain molecular simulations. Uh, here we don't describe these particles uh, atomistically. We have lots of different lipids in the membrane. Then we have different proteins whose sizes are different. In this particular case, there are about 10 different proteins. Uh, what is important is to look at the dynamics. Uh, usually a protein diffusion is about 10 to 5 times slower compared to lipid diffusion. In principle, this implies that proteins don't move. If you are looking at microsecond time scale, you don't observe proteins to diffuse at all in the, pl in the plane of the membrane. But because of these coarse current simulations, we are able to probe the uh, time scales of seconds, you are able to see how proteins are uh, sampling the environment, they are forming complexes. So proteins are getting together to form protein-protein complexes where many proteins together form some sort of oligomers. You can follow all these dynamic events in, in semi-molecular, so, uh, in a semi-realistic manner, a semi-realistic meaning that the physics is the right one, but some of the chemistry is lost because of the coarse graining procedure. And then after doing these coarse grain simulations, you are able to fine grain these coarse grain models back to atomistic representation and, and continue by atomistic simulations to look at the fine details. And this is a nice way to understand how the biology really happens. All right, having said that, let me move on and, and take some time to describe some examples about how computer simulations can be used to understand biology. Uh, I like this image because this is highlighting that computer simulations can do something important. I, I think that none of us debates the importance of your heart. If our heart is not working properly, then yeah, yeah, you know, bad things happen. Uh, but what keeps us, our heart beating? It's a pretty complex procedure, but there is one particular protein which is important, known as beta-2 adrenergic receptor. It's one of the T protein couple receptors, uh, which essentially does the following. It receives a signal, a ligand, binding to the receptor. It's activated through activation. It, it sends a signal to the cardiac tissue, which releases calcium and calcium in turn is regulating the beating of your heart. And this protein therefore is the key molecule which is involved in this regulation process of keeping your heart beating. This protein is somehow impaired. If its function is impaired, then the news are not nice. How this protein is modulated? That's another question because it's embedded in a membrane. And, and quite recent experiments have revealed that cholesterol is playing some sort of important role. Um, 
the experiments done by Daniel Muller and his group in Basel, they figured out that if you have cholesterol bound to the uh, in environment around this protein, then the thermal stability of a protein is, is increased. Thermal stability meaning that the fluctuations are weaker, somehow weakened because of cholesterol. If you don't have a cholesterol interacting with the receptor, then the thermal fluctuations are increasing. So the receptor is somehow just a kind of wild animal doing something, but not doing what it's expected to do. We started doing simulations to better understand what is going on. Here is an example. The protein, beta 2 r is here in the middle. We are looking at the system from top. These particles are round, they are lipid molecules. Um, we don't show every molecule, every lipid molecule. We only show here the cholesterol molecules. And, and every one of these uh, uh, moving molecules is cholesterol, despite the fact that we are using different colors. Uh, we just identify some of the lipids by color since they interact with protein surface longer compared to the rest of the cholesterol molecules. And now to understand the main message, look at this blue one. It comes from bottom right. It's, it's coming closer. It kicks other cholesterol molecules away because it wants to go into this sort of one and to say that this, this protein is mine, get away, this is mine. Now, after binding to the protein surface, it remains there for microseconds. So there's some high affinity site, possibly an allosteric binding site where this cholesterol molecule likes to be. After doing the simulations many times under different conditions, we figured that cholesterol has an effect on the protein behavior. Um, there's quite a bit of data here, but let me just illustrate what is going on. We have a plot describing the correlation between the width on the extracellular binding side uh, where the ligand is binding, and then on the G-protein binding side, on the cytosolic side of the membrane where the G-protein is binding. So LL is a width of the ligand binding site. LG is a width of the G-protein binding site in this protein. And here we show a graph for a histogram as a function of ligand binding side width and G protein binding side width. Vivat cholesterol, we observe that there are quite strong fluctuations between two conformations, one here and another here. It basically says that when we don't have cholesterol in a membrane, then this protein is like fluctuating back and forth all the time, quite strongly. However, if you have cholesterol included, then the uh, protein conformation is fixed to a unique one where the widths of the ligand binding site and G-protein binding site, they're pretty much the same. They don't fluctuate much. And that implies that if you add cholesterol about 10 mol percent, then instead of having these strong fluctuations, you have a, a, a conformation where the protein is just very mildly fluctuating but these fluctuations are very, very modest. And one knows that cholesterol is involved in the, in the activation process. So to make a long story short, it turned out that cholesterol and lipids, generally speaking, are able to mem uh, modulate membrane receptor structure and also dynamics, for example, through all this allosteric binding. Then, as another example, one can consider glycans. Uh, experimentally, it's known that glycosylation, where glycans are added to the protein structure, are important for protein activation, uh, protein transport, uh, and so forth. So there, is, there are very good reasons to better understand what these glycans are doing. Also, based on experimental literature, uh, this, this chemical content of the glycans is important. Uh, quite often one has galactose, mannose, and fucose, which are the abandoned glycans attached. However, if you have diseases such as cancer, then the uh, content of sialic acids is very, very pronounced compared to healthy tissue. So simply by identifying the glycans attached to the proteins, one can see whether the tissue is somehow damaged. And, and it has, 
it's going along a trajectory that ends up in a major disease. How much do we understand about glycosylation and its effects on protein uh, functionality? Very little, absolutely very little. And there are many reasons why we don't understand. Uh, quite many proteins, they have many glycosylation sites, but it doesn't mean that every one of them are glycosylated. Then if you're doing mass spec, then you are able to see um, what glycans are there in the proteins, but mass spec doesn't tell where are these glycans. So to which glycosylation sites they have been attached to. Um, then if you want to understand the effects of glycans one by one, it's a tedious process where you first have to mutate every other uh, um, glycosylation site except for one, then add glycans to the specific glycosylation site you would like to explore, and then look at its effects. And then you do that one by one for every one of the glycosylation sites. Then you consider two glycans at the same time in different spots, three glycans in different places, having all the others uh, uh, sort of mutated that they do not like, uh, form glycans. And, and it's a very tedious exercise, absolutely. Uh, I'm not saying that in simulations it's, it's much easier since there is a universal number of different combinations one has to explore, but at least the basic principles can be studied quite easily because you, have, you always have a primary part in, in N glycans, for example, which can be used, and then you can tune the rest of the glycan such that you understand the basic information, what the glycans are really doing, for example, for visibility of the, of the protein for the, for the ligands trying to, to attack, attack these, these protein receptors. So for simulations, we can do very controlled experiments um, to have at least a basic understanding about what glycans are doing in the first place. Here's one example we did a few years ago. Uh, uh, this is EGFR, Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor, uh, which, is, which has been studied in experiments a lot. Uh, I did this survey in Web of Science many years ago. It turned out that there are 40,000, 45,000 papers published in EGFR, and that this survey was indeed done many, many years ago. So nowadays, I think it's 50,000 plus. So I would say that this protein is important for health. And yes, there are glycosylation sites, uh, about 11 in this particular protein. We decided to glycosylate every one of them all together to look at what is the extremal effect if you add as many glycans as possible. And these glycans are shown by these transparent uh, Legos bound to the structure. There are some what we uh, sort of surface of a protein that is facing water. Some glycans are next to the membrane water interface interacting with the membrane. So to understand what we are doing, here are two simulations. On the left, we have a non-glycosylated case. On the right hand side, we have a glycosylated situation having these uh, 11 different glycans um, attached to the protein. Please focus on the membrane water interface, this region down here. What we observe is that for the non-glycosylated EGFR, the ectodomain is very strongly bound to the membrane. However, for the glycosylated situation, this ectodomain is lifted upwards closer to the water face. So somehow, for some reason, it's not bound to the membrane as strongly as in the non-glycosylated situation. And this turns out to be true. These glycans, they are acting as entropy barriers. They are lifting this ectodomain further to the water phase simply by, by creating an entropic barrier such that these ectodomain is not able to bind to the membrane as strongly as in the case without the glycans. And it turned out, based on experiments reported in the same paper, that if you have the glycans in place, they are somehow affecting 
the visibility of the ligand binding site. So the ligand binding to the receptor is dependent on the visibility of the uh, ligands around the lig lig ligand binding site. Another story is described here for CD2. Uh, it's a very nice protein because it also has a biological function in adhesion, and then it's pretty small, so it's easy to simulate. To make a long story short, it turned out that this receptor is very strongly bound to the receptor membrane water interface, as, as de depicted here, if the lipid composition is matching non-draft conditions, that is, without cholesterol and without sphingolipids, and when this protein is not glycosylated. However, if you do glycosylate this protein, you add these glycans shown in red, and then you also change the lipid composition to raft like conditions where you have lots of cholesterol and sphingolipids. Then this ectodomain just lifts up and starts standing upright, as depicted here. The question is, why does it happen? What is causing this? Well, there are two reasons. First, just like in the EGFR case, these glycans next to the membrane water interface, they're acting as entropy barrier. They are pushing this ectodomain to stand upright. They try to avoid a situation where this membrane ecto so a protein ectodomain would fall down to the membrane. But it's not just a full story. At the same time, electrostatics is important. Quite many of the residues in this protein are charged, and these charges are interacting with the uh, 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 polar head groups of the lipids, and they track this receptor down to the membrane water interface. And that depends on the lipid composition. To prove that, what we did is that we took a native CD2 protein and then we deprotonated all the charged residues one by one in the ectodomain. So here are the residues which are typically charged. So what we did was that we essentially neutralized every one of them by mutation. And after these charged residues were neutralized to not have any charge anymore, it turned out that the CD2 ectodomain, which was lying along the membrane, just started lifting up as I described and started standing upright. So there are two effects which are affecting the ectodomain conformation and also the visibility of its ectodomain and the binding site for the ligands binding to this protein. And these two effects are entropic interactions because of the ligands and then electrostatic interactions. Somehow these two effects are working in unison in a concerted action lipids and glycans working together. Then I think I have some time to look. So let me uh, discuss another idea based on a process which also many of you would consider important. That is how to stay alive. Breathing, oxygen. Already in high school, we were told that when we breathe, oxygen gets into our lungs. Then it gets into blood circulation where hemoglobin takes oxygen and carries that to the, to the cells in, in our body. So hemoglobin is important. But what high school physics and chemistry and biology did not tell is that how on earth the oxygen in our lungs is able to get through the lungs surfactant into the blood circulation to see where hemoglobin is. There's a barrier, a biological barrier, the lung surfactant, which is a mixture of lipids and proteins. And nobody understands the structure. Yes, nobody <laughs> understands what the lung surfactant really is. It's some sort of a very complex network mess or something, but it has a very important role since it regulates uh, uh, the transport of oxygen from our lungs to blood circulation, and also the transport of carbon dioxide as a toxic compound from our body back to the, uh, 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 our lungs that we can breathe it away. 
So how does it do it? How does the lang really, really carry out this function? Uh, it would be important to understand this because there are quite many uh, lung-based diseases which are very difficult to treat. And if you don't understand how the lung act really functions or how oxygen is, is permeating through the lung surfactant, then it's quite difficult to figure out any, any ways to treat these diseases. Many of these diseases are, are particularly important for newborn babies because their lungs are so sensitive, so subtle, and, and any, any damage might, might compromise their health. Another uh, very uh, current uh, 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 disease is patient ARDS, accurate, acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, ARDS, which is a, a disease of its own, a, a pretty severe one, but this is also reflected in, in COVID-19. Since one of the side effects of COVID-19 is that uh, the, the lungs are, are, are not working properly because of excess uh, moisture, which is impairing the lung function. So we, we still have a basic question. How does oxygen permeate through lung surfactant? Uh, it turns out that there's one or maybe two proteins which are uh, particularly important in this process. Generally speaking, there are four proteins which are important in lungs, known as SPA, SPB, SPC, SPD. The guys who invented these proteins were not very in innovative in, in figuring out the names of these proteins, but at least these are easy to remember. SPA and SPD are not so important. They are playing a role in certain aspects of, of lung function, but they are not crucial for our health. Uh, however, SPB, the surfactant protein B, that is crucially important because if you don't have it, then you die. Amen. That's it. So SPB, its function should be understood. SPC is also important because based experiments done by Jesus Perez Gil and, and his collaborators, SPB is somehow fostering the activation of SPB. Most likely SPB and SPC, they somehow work together on a molecular level. Details are not understood, but they do something together. But please keep in mind, SPB, surfactant protein B, that is the key protein because that is involved in oxygen transfer through the lung surfactant. Uh, to do some simulations to better understand this process, we started from experiments done by Jesus's uh, lab in, in Madrid. They identify low resolution structures for SPB complexes. So it's not just a single SPB molecule, but a mixture of many SPB proteins bound together. And, and, and the experiments tell or predict that they are forming some sort of complex, which, is, which has a torridus shape, hole in the middle, and then stuff uh, around it. Uh, we use experimental data uh, to which we were fitting our, our simulation models, first to create uh, dimers of SPB proteins using saposin B as a template because they are belonging to the same family. Most likely they have quite a bit of similarity. So that was a template. Based on that, we furthermore created uh, oligomers of these SPB dimers such that the match experimental, uh, experimental structures was as good as possible. And I'm not saying that this hexamer we are using here in the simulations is the only one, the only oligomer uh, having a role in biology, but it was the smallest one which was able to uh, uh, fit all the experimental data we were using in constructing the simulation models. So this seems to make sense. And Hannah Hezos was also uh, involved in, in this work, so his input was highly invaluable in creating a simulation model. It turns out that when we simulated these SPB complexes next to a membrane uh, uh, what interface, these protein complexes bind to a membrane. You see this pretty strong binding. And then lipids are migrating through the hole in this protein complex. <laughs> we also found that some lipids are favored more than the others. In particular, cholesterol and PG, they have lots of contacts with a protein 
in particular for residues from 30 to 60. So these graphs are showing uh, the probability of having a contact with a protein for different lipid types. DPPC, which is a most abundant lipid surfactant, POPC, which is slightly unsaturated, phosphatidylglycerol, which is uh, charged, and then based on experiments, without PG, no binding takes place, and cholesterol, about 10 to 15 mole percent of, of lipids in lung surfactant are cholesterol, and that's also important for lung function. And here is on the x-axis, just a residue number for the amino acids in, in the sequence. So we see that cholesterol and PG are, are favored more than PCs uh, regarding the membrane protein contacts. Then in different simulation studies, we identified that uh, if you don't have PG, then this lipid uh, uh, profile inside this protein complex does not take place. So if you don't have PG, then somehow some of the functions of this uh, SPB complex are, are compromised. Without cholesterol, you also see the same thing, that this lipid profile inside this SPB complex disappears, but only under conditions where you have a physiological lipid profile having all of these lipids, DPPC, POPC, cholesterol, POPG, found in reality, then you observe that these lipid profiles are inside the SPB complex. And that tells that quite likely oxygen could be able to permeate through these SPB complexes too. Here are some additional data describing the contact frequency of, of different lipids when this SPB complex is bound to a membrane interface. PC doesn't show much, but if you have PG or cholesterol in a membrane, then you see pretty strong binding, in particular for cholesterol, where there are some specific cholesterol binding points, binding sites, sort of on one of the principal interfaces, since there are two interfaces in the SPB complex, one on both sides. This is what we are now proposing based on these data together, the experimental data published earlier, that SPB is forming complexes, which are creating routes for oxygen to permeate from the water phase into the uh, membrane structures, and then one by one, get through the lung surfactant membranes or the complex shape finally ending up in blood circulation and find hemoglobin. Um, there are quite many predictions here, but at least we have a hypothetical picture that can be used as a basis for testing the scenario uh, using both simulations, additional simulations and experiments. All right, I, I think I still have a bit of time, so let me go through the last example here for Sabin. Uh, this is one of the hot topics in the field right now, since uh, there's some new uh, structural data coming for the Sabian protein in the context of lipid droplet formation. Uh, lipid droplets are those which we are using quite often if you go and, and buy some fast food, say Big Macs. If you take one Big Mac or two or three at the same time, then there's a quite a bit of energy ending up in your body. And, and your body is not able to use all that energy right away. It has to be stored. And this energy is stored in terms of the lipids inside lipid droplets. So lipid droplets are basically storage vehicles for energy. After eating, they are formed. And then if you're on diet, don't eat, then bit by bit, the lipid droplets, the content are used uh, for energy production inside a cell. And they also have other functions, but but this is just one of the key ones. Uh, the big question is that how do these lipid droplets actually form? Uh, experiments tell that there are some key proteins which are involved, without which droplet formation is very difficult to take place, or it doesn't happen at all. And the most important is one, the most important one is Sabin, which is a protein in the ER uh, where it's doing something. 
I'm, I'm quite vague here because I don't know. And I think nobody knows. And it's based on the published data. Nobody understands what exactly Sapien is doing. So we started doing simulations together with Elena Econen's team here in Helsinki, who were doing uh, experiments in the same, in the same project to, to understand how Leibniz interact with the uh, Sapien structure. Uh, we used the most recent uh, crystal structures for the uh, lumen or Sabin bound to the membrane water interface. Then we, use, we are using other techniques to create the transmembrane domain structure uh, such that this lumen is embedded in the membrane. And, and this realistic atomistic simulation model together the coarse brain simulations, we used to understand how different lipids are interacting with a Sabin protein. It turns out that the key molecule is tag, triacylglycerols. In the absence of sapin, tags are clustering. They are forming clusters of many tags bound together, but they don't do anything else. They are not able to form lipid droplets effectively. Experiments, on the other hand, say that if you have these tag clusters, and if you also have sapin, then you just wait a bit, and then poof, these lipid droplets they emerge. You can identify them you know, from from uh, the inside of a cell in a living cell. So what happens here? Simulations predict that these tag clusters, after forming, they find sapin. They are binding to the sapin. So Sapin is like a nucleation site for creating larger and larger tag clusters. And, and it's collecting all possible tags together to be embedded inside this layer sapin structure. What happens after this point is not really understood yet, but our, our simulations identified that there are specific residues in the sapin structure, which are making sapin to be nucleation sites. Uh, there's one particular serine, S166, identified here, which is interacting with the uh, glycerol group of, of triglycerides, tags. Uh, I think this image on the left depicts this process quite nicely. We have one particular tag diffusing inside this lumen, inside the sapin protein. This blue trajectory describes the diffusion when this particular residue, serine 166, is not interacting. With this, uh, uh, this blue tra tra trajectory describes the diffusion of a tag molecule when the tag is not interacting with serine 166. So it's really diffusing quite rapidly. However, when this residue is interacting, with this particular residue, it binds there and remains there and diffusion is blocked. It no longer moves. So there's one particular residue in the saving structure, which is catching tax. And if it's able to catch one of them, then the tax molecule, which has high affinity for other tax, then catches another tag, which in turn catches another. So bit by bit, the tag cluster inside the sapin structure increases in size, increases further. And then what we observe is the formation of a tag cluster inside the sapin lumen. Quite intriguing. In nucleation site arises because of specific protein lipid interaction. And that is highlighted by, by this tiny image right here. The details are given in the paper, but here again, the, the point was that uh, simulations were able to predict new phenomena. They were able to explain what happens in experiments because we see simulation findings were completely consistent experiments done in Elena Econen's lab. And, and all in all, there is quite a bit of added value given by simulations to understand experimental data. All right, let me conclude here. 
There are many strengths in biomolecular simulations. Uh, first of all, we are able to provide nanoscale insight over spatial scales and time scales, which can't be reached by experimental techniques. That's one thing. Uh, in this particular context, simulations are able to uh, both predict and also confirm experimental findings, uh, help to understand experimental findings, how lipids and other modulation mechanisms are able to alter protein behavior. And obviously, you can use simulation techniques for all possible biophysical processes. The key point is that nonetheless, simulations are dependent on one particular aspect. And that is that you have access to protein data, protein structure data. If you don't have any data for the protein structure, it's very difficult to get started. Uh, of course, you can create a, a protein model for your own body, it might be a toy model having no coupling to reality. It must say that you have collaborators doing cryo-EM, X-ray studies, NMR, you name it, to find protein structures. And after you have a very good protein structure, you can use that as a basis in your biomolecular simulations to understand what really happens. What are, what are these proteins doing dynamically? And finally, one of the key limitations also is that, of course, your simulation model is at most as good as its brains, the brains being the force field, its interaction description. If there's something wrong in your force field, then yes, then, then you can't trust your simulation predictions very well. But, but the force fields used in the field right now, for example, char 36, OPLS, Amber, they are pretty good. Quite often the generic behavior is given correctly and also the quantitative numbers are better and better over time compared to experiments. Okay, hopefully I was able to convince some of you that uh, collaborations between simulation uh, groups and experimental teams makes sense and, and doing simulations would also be fun. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilpo. So, so I'm sorry I missed a few because I had to listen into another meeting parallel. That's the were life of Zoom. But I, I especially liked your uh, this with um, Sapin, uh, the, this uh, Triglis right stuff. I think that is very cool. I think is uh, very important. Uh, often forget and we look so much into uh, biomembrane that we forget that lipids are everywhere in every form and shape that uh, and, um, we don't uh, understand com completely how they behave. So is there any que questions for Ilpo? Anybody? And there is a raised hand. Who is that? That's Yen. Yen, good on you. Go Thanks. for it. Um, so I had a question about um, you, in the example you showed with the um, uh, oh, what was the title of the slide? Um, large scale behavior. Um, of kind of proteins and um, in a membrane with coarse grained models. You said that you can then fine grain the results back to, uh, I'm guessing, kind of atomistic level. Um, how, how exactly does kind of that process work? <laughs> that makes sense? It is uh, it's a partly an engineering problem and partly a biological problem. So, when you create coarse grain models, of course, the uh, amount of detail you can include is limited. This is obvious. And then you do a uh, long time scale simulations using your coarse grain model. Uh, you end up with something, for example, the final snapshot of your simulation, which you want to fine grain back to the atomistic representation. Uh, it's quite easy in principle, you just, uh, Take these blobs which contain many atoms. You use some educated guess how they might be there inside this blob, such so that the different blobs can be connected to each other, that the carbon carbon bonding and so forth, all of these conditions are respected. You can easily do that. But what is the most uh, 
reliable final structure after doing this fine graining, since there's a universal number of different options how to do that. Yes, you are clever. You understand this point. Uh, so in, in practice, one has to test different scenarios and, and end up with some educated guess which makes the most of sense. And, and what we do after that is that after the fine graining process has been done, instead of a coarse grain model, you have an atomistic model uh, matching the last snapshot of your coarse grained simulation. Then you slowly try to equilibrate your atomistic system. So you don't take the uh, atomistic system after fine graining as, as, the, as the proof but you let the system equilibrate. So you, you continue the simulation atomistically for a few nanoseconds, maybe 100 nanoseconds. It depends on, on how long it takes until you see that the system has truly equilibrated and, and there are no major driving forces to change the protein behavior anymore. So it is a very careful process. The engineering part is that you can always find some sort of mapping from the coarse grain to the atomistic representation. But the biology is that you let, you have to very kindly, very smoothly find conditions through equilibration that your, your model seems right. And, and this is completely fine. You can always do atomistic simulations over quite long times, matching or starting from the coarse grain model. And then you observe better how atomistic behavior affects your system properties. Thank you. A very good question. Okay. She's my boss, you know, Ilpo. So. <laughs> so, so is there any other question for, for, for um, Ilpo? I think it is very good your emphasis that 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 um, experiment and and uh, simulations always have to go hand in hand. I mean, it's always uh, it's always tempting when you see the simulation with beautiful pictures and and the, it looks always convincing, while a scattering curve look horribly boring and then and so on. But if you can link the two together and uh, make some sense of it and uh, mm. yes very, very important yeah, yeah, yeah. When I also that... we are struggling when we do reflectometry for instance on model membrane to to do the data fitting in a realistic way and uh, i mean for a flat bilayer and which is ideal uh, dppc and so on it is not a major thing but when it start to curve and buckle and and uh, stuff like that even on a support layer then yeah then you're lost and then it will be very helpful it, it's complicated but you it will be helpful to for the evaluation of the data and also predict what you can expect that's yes. an important aspect yeah. yeah so when i started i i highlighted this idea that it's very very easy to uh, design simulation models but it's much more difficult to design simulation models which are matching reality yeah yeah mm. Okay. Oh, question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, oh, Jing has a question. How? Uh, what is it? Uh, You're uh, very welcome. Oh, yes. So I think I can just shout, shout out. Yes, I want to ask a question that you have a. I remember you have a model, a membrane, and then you have protein, and then you say if you have the, some weakened uh, glycolization, and then it is like more. Uh, uh, leaving the membrane and you say it is because of the uh, entropic and the electrostatic uh, um, some kind of effects yes. I wonder how, how to understand this entropic effect uh, why if you have some binding and then the entropic is like changed uh, it's like a, a beach effect uh, if you don't have any these these balloons uh, when you are taking sun at a beach, then you are just lying along the ground. However, if you have a balloon, you can put it under your, under your belly 
and then you try to lie along the beach again. You can't do the, you can't do that because the balloon is is between your belly and and the beach, right? So the the balloon is is lifting your body up upwards towards the air. So these glycans are doing basically the same thing. The primary effect is entropic interaction that they are taking some space which the protein is not able to occupy. And by taking space, they are enforcing the protein to lift themselves from the membrane water interface to the water phase. That is what I mean by the entropic effect. They are taking space which other proteins are not able to occupy at the same time. Okay. And then uh, what about hydrophobic effect? Will that be like any important in this case? Uh, hydrophobic effects are included in our simulations indirectly. Uh, so uh, hydrophobic effect is, is not really an interaction. It's a mixture of different interactions which end up in an effect, which we know as the hydrophobic effect. Uh, it's basically a, a difference between uh, uh, water-loving and water-hating interactions. And, and uh, we, we describe that in the force fields in terms of uh, uh, hydrogen bonding, which is an electrostatic interaction, and then through Van der Waals interactions, which also in part is a kind of electrostatic interaction. Okay. So, for example, if we don't have hydrogen bonding per se in the simulation model, but hydrogen bonding appears because of electrostatic interactions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for this clarifying. It's important to know that uh, it's not a hydrophobic force, it's a hydrophobic effect. So it's... Um, so. Uh, let's thank uh, Ilfo again. We will have five minutes break before we have uh, the next lecture. I see that Motomo is already there. And uh, did you ever meet uh, Motomo when you were with Ola or? Um, yeah, so can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, great. So Ufo, thanks a lot for a great lecture. I joined from the middle, but yeah, I enjoyed a lot and I love your papers, yeah? Yeah, great Thank to see you. you. Great to see you. Uh, you both have uh, Ola and, and uh, Pavo in the common, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ola made me uh, one of the really good friends of sushi and seaweed. Oh, I see. Yeah, I invited him two years ago to Kyoto and ah. he held a lecture in front of Japanese talking about sushi. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it was very yeah, interesting. I yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he has written many nice books about social and seaweed, yes. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful books. Hmm.